All right, good morning. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Coffee Kids and Sports Medicine. Uh, uh, welcome to those in the room and uh, to the folks joining us online. Um, I tell you, I just wanna call out to uh, Jared and Dr. Ellis and Brandy and all the others who have put in so much work uh, for this series. I think it is really a fantastic educational opportunity. Uh, and so I just, I'm really appreciative of the team and, and very proud that we have it to offer. Um, here are the disclosures that we have for today's uh, presentation. And then I would invite everyone, whether you're in the room or uh, online, this is where we want to pause uh, just a minute and uh, you can scan this uh, to uh, sign in uh, so that you're uh, not only logged in but able to get the, the credits for that as well. So I'll give you just a minute on that. All right, and um, we'd like to, to point out some of the upcoming opportunities. Our last live event for, for 2023 would be uh, this October 17th event. Uh, Dr. Chung and Taylor Morrison uh, presenting uh, Nutrition, Bone Health, and Performance in Young Athletes, a very timely and uh, topical um, event. And then um, we'd call your attention to the online opportunities, our, our alternatives to opi opioids, uh, uh, excellent information, uh, kind of chock full of information, honestly. So I, I would really encourage you guys to take advantage of that if you haven't had the opportunity to do so. And uh, uh, excellent uh, opportunity to recognize our advanced practice providers. This, uh, these are our uh, workhorses and uh, superstars. Uh, you know, I, uh, as the medical director, I get an opportunity to see a lot of patient and family feedback, and I will tell you that this group uh, outshines the physicians uh, every single time. They're superstars, and uh, the uh, families uh, feel like these are their folks and often don't want to see us as physicians, which I think is entirely appropriate. So I would definitely... Uh, give my appreciation and I look forward to this week. All right, well, I'd uh, like to turn it over to Jared. Jared's gonna introduce our fantastic panel. Uh, I think these case-based discussions are always our very best and so really looking forward to a discussion of hand injuries in our adolescent athletes. Uh, Jared has uh, been a leader uh, with us for a very, very long time, one of that APP group and has lead, led our fracture clinic. Uh, and his uh, clinical uh, and organizational expertise is fantastic. So Jared, thanks. Uh, we appreciate you and turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. So uh, today's talk was really kind of born out of uh, feedback from you guys. Uh, we had a lot of requests over, over time of doing some hand injuries, particularly with our athletic trainers. Um, some of our pediatricians, our emergency room folks as well. So uh, this, this talk is really in response to that. We wanted to kind of create a, uh, a way to highlight some of the intricacies in dealing with these hand injuries in our, our athletes. So we thought what better way than put together kind of a, a panel of experts that would kind of help with that process. Uh, so our panel today, uh, we have Jennifer LeMabe, who is a, uh, the athletic trainer over at Centennial Frisco High School. Uh, she has greater than 20 years of, uh, of experience treating uh, and seeing patients uh, athletes over at that school and amongst all the sports she covers, uh, just a wealth of knowledge from her sideline coverage. Uh, Katrina Mascarella is a uh, the Director of Sports Medicine Outreach at Achieve Physical Therapy. She also works PRN here at Scottish Wright as an athletic trainer with us and our team. Uh, she has a uh, also a wealth of knowledge covering multiple different sports, uh, and, and including some of the more fringe sports, uh, I think some rodeo experience, is that right? I'm, I'm working on rodeo experience. Rodeo experience. Um, hockey, rugby, hockey, lacrosse. Rugby, yeah, some of the, some of the more. <laughs> Um, some of the, did, did you cover some fights as well at one point? Um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. There we go. So, yeah. you know, hand injury certainly comes with that. Um, then Dr. Shay Miller, you guys all probably know Dr. Miller. He is uh, one of our sports medicine physicians here at Scottish Rite. He's the director of, our, uh, med uh, of medical sports medicine. And then Lindsay Williams is our uh, occupational therapist here at the Frisco campus. Uh, she's a rock star. She's really our go-to for, for both our team in the fracture clinic as well as our hand team. Um, she does a lot of work with these uh, athletes and, and really all of our patients that are in need of, of somebody kind of work getting them back to return to play or just return to function in general. So lots and lots of knowledge there. She's uh, been in practice for over 15 years and, and boy, we, we heavily rely on her for uh, creative splinting, creative uh, splints to get the kids to be able to play and, and, and as well as just kind of creative ways of getting these kids back to normal function and return to play. 
We do have a lot of material to kind of move through. We'll try to glide through some of this. Um, our objectives today, kind of like we just talked about, we really want to kind of highlight the challenges in managing these athletes, um, both from, or really from all, all angles, right? The, the sideline physician or the athletic trainer covering the sideline, as well as the treating provider once they've been diagnosed, uh, the, the family psychological piece of it. There's, there's a lot that goes into when a uh, athlete needs to be pulled from play, as well as when they need to be put back into play. So we have nothing to disclose. Uh, the agenda, very similar to our objectives, but we want to review some common hand injuries. Uh, we're going to highlight those challenges we talked about from the athletic trainer, the team physician on the sideline, the treating provider, the occupational therapist, uh, some, maybe some pearls hopefully you'll walk away with of managing these in the acute, uh, the acute setting. And then kind of talk about some statistics, why this matters. So just a little background, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that 25% of uh, sports-related injuries involve the hand or the wrist. Uh, when football season hit a few weeks ago, boy, we certainly saw that in clinic. Um, I would say it's every bit of that uh, 25%. Um, you know, accurate diagnosis and early immobilization is often keys to getting these guys back playing early or as early as possible. And then this last one, again, doesn't really surprise me when you sit and think about it. At first it did, you know, the most expensive category of all sports-related injuries. If you think about that with ACLs and big surgeries, shoulders, knees, kind of hard to, to kind of imagine that this is the more expensive one when you talk about it globally in the healthcare uh, market. But if you think about it in a sense of how many of these get missed or overlooked or undertreated and how many of them have pretty invasive procedures down the road, um, time with therapists all, all the way across the board and then the, the sheer volume of them. I certainly think that makes a lot more sense. To that point, uh, Dr. Sterling Bunnell, the thought of the father of hand surgery, had this quote of the first doctor, or in this case treating provider, who sees a patient with a hand injury most influences the final result. I think that's pretty applicable to our talk today if you really think about you guys on the sideline that, that covers sideline care, you athletic trainers that are often the first line for these athletes and who sees them initially. Uh, when can an athlete return to play? It's a tricky question. I think there's a lot that goes into this. You have to think about not only the athlete, the function, the psychological component. Um, there's lots of variables that play into this. And who's, who's really the best to make that decision, right? Is it the, the team physician who saw it initially, knows the kid, knows the team, knows the coaches, knows the circumstances, the treating provider who had the x-ray, the diagnosis, the treatment plan, uh, then that athletic trainer who really probably has the best chance or the, the best opportunity to evaluate that player on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of gather the both function as well as the psychological component of when they're ready to go back or most ready to go back. The occupational therapist who, uh, like we've talked about with Lindsay's role, is, is really the one that gets these kids going and gets that range of motion and function and strength back. And then you got to factor in the family and the coach, right? There's a lot of players in this scenario, so we all have to be kind of mindful of that. So who is, who is best suited to make that decision? I think we'll try to touch on that a little bit later and come back to this. So we're going to start with the question for you guys in the panel. Um, I've got $100 in my pocket, and I want to know which one of you will take the bet if you can match the x-ray to the clinical photo. The catch is, if you're willing to take that bet, if you get it wrong, you owe me $100. Who's taking the bet? Anybody got a hand up on the panel? Anybody feeling confident? I will not take that bet. <laughs> right, it's a challenge, right? We just don't know. These, these x-rays are, are pretty impressive. The exam on some of these are pretty impressive. The, the clinical photo is impressive, right? Uh, but the reality is, without that x-ray, we just don't know. So not going to do it with the clinical photos. What about if I give you an exam? Does that help you? Feel more confident? Feeling lucky if we get this exam? <laughs> so we'll do a little kid, digital cascade. I apologize, the, the volume's not working on here. But we'll do a palm up, palm down, digital cascade. You can kind of see that ring finger on the... the right hand. You can see that bruising down around the MCPJ. Still pretty limited, right? I mean, you, you get your basic exam, but uh, information is limited. So no tenderness down distally, a little bit of tenderness medially, certainly tender over that proximal phalanx and over the MCPJ as well as down in the, uh, uh, the head of the metacarpal where the bruising is. So any different there? Anybody willing to take the bet now? Got an exam. Feeling sporty? No takers? Nobody? Okay. Okay. Well, I don't blame you. It's hard, right? Um, you guys are really at a disadvantage when you're on the sideline. You, you have an exam. You're in the moment. You have to deal with the pressure of the player, of the coach, uh, of the family, um, of the circumstances of the situation, right? Is this the uh, championship? Is this the uh, 
the state meet. There's a lot of factors that play into that decision making and I do not envy that role at all. Um, I do not do sideline coverage and, and boy, uh, especially after putting this together, it really highlights to me that the challenges you guys have. It makes it a lot easier when they get to me and they, they have an example of, with an x-ray and uh, or a, an x-ray that we can kind of look at. Uh, to highlight that with the coach, right, this is kind of that coach mentality a lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times. You know, it's just a finger. Uh, Johnny had played with his finger broken. Uh, get back in there. We, we can do this. Just tape it up and let's go. And, you know, a finger fracture is not just a finger fracture. We have that discussion a lot with families because it's often that they want to compare um, so-and-so's injury on the team that's playing in a cast to maybe their son or daughter's injury and why they can't play in a cast. And then you have to take a step back and really explain to them that, a uh, fracture of the wrist or a fracture of the arm or a fracture of the hand or the finger, there's, there's a lot of variation in there and some are a little safer than others. Uh, but again, it, it really starts with that, that fact that I, I get an x-ray that, that helps me be able to make that decision with confidence. And so you guys are really in a challenge of knowing when you can put that kid back into play. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So simplifying the hand exam, you know, I like to take the methodical approach. I think doing the same thing repetitively over and over and over, it becomes second nature. It kind of leads to not missing things. Uh, you kind of go through that step-by-step -step approach. Uh, always exam palm up and down. Uh, fortunately, God gave us a contralateral hand. We can look at both sides. It gives us a point of reference, and, and that makes it a lot easier to examine the upper extremity of the hand in general. Um, it'd be foolish not to use that, so uh, you, you certainly need to con compare to that contralateral side. You're looking for gross deformity side-to-side -side function comparison. That digital cascade exam we just did um, is a really, really important one. It kind of helps us know if there's rotational deformity. Uh, also gives you a sense of uh, kind of gross motor function, so you want to be, be mindful of the sensory motor function, neurovascular status. Uh, range of motion, um, you don't necessarily have to know the specifics, right? I don't care that you know what each joint is supposed to flex maximally to or extend maximally to, but just being able to recognize asymmetry is probably the most important thing, especially in that acute setting. Um, lacerations or bleeding, is it deep or superficial? What lies below? You know, is this crossing a joint or a tendon? Uh, being mindful of that, knowing uh, when, when something's a little bit uh, more emergent than others. And then do I need an x-ray? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? I don't know that there's a, a clear answer to that. I think everybody's probably got their own threshold. My personal threshold, if they've got swelling and bruising, if they've got limited range of motion, um, especially if it's been greater than 24, 48 hours, that's probably reasonable to get an x-ray on. Um, that's, that's kind of just a simple deal. Going back to those pictures, those clinical photos, you just can't tell by looking at it. You can't tell by examining it. Without that crystal ball, there's just no way to know. So let's, let's start with a couple case studies and kind of roll through these a little bit. Katrina, this is going to be for you, okay? Uh, this is a 14-year-old female. Her name is Katie. So we see that block there. Uh, she's a freshman multi-sport athlete. I'll do that video one more time so everybody can see it. It's short. Good. Okay. Again, multi-sport athlete, freshman year. She is seen on the sideline. When you see her, she's got slight limit, slightly limited range of motion at the PIP joint. Uh, she's able to make a full composite fist, but does have to kind of push through that pain. But she is able to get there. Uh, mild swelling and effusion at the PIPJ. She's got that bolar ecchymosis you can see in the photo there. And then she's focally tender over the collateral ligaments and volarly at the PIP joint. So Katrina, what, uh, what are you doing? What's your plan here? What are you going to do with her? Are you letting her play? This, this game is halfway over. Um, what side are we on for the game? <laughs> well, let's just say they're about halfway. Just halfway. Halfway. They're halfway okay. through the game. It's a, it's a tournament. We'll make it a tournament too. She's got more games. Okay. We got more games today? Yep. Okay. Yep. So are you going to you gonna let her play? Or are you going to? So it's going to completely depend for me on with fingers if we have, because it's slightly limited range of motion. So I'm going to probably sit her out for the rest of this game and see how we feel afterwards, if we can kind of get it to settle down a little bit with um, either like taping up the joint or maybe putting some KT tape on there to help with a little bit of the swelling, maybe promote some more range of motion. Um, we can put some ice on there if we have like a good break in between games to see if we can kind of help get some of that swelling down. Um, but it'll be completely dependent on her pain level afterwards. If she's still having quite a bit of pain, I'm not going to be really comfortable putting her back in. If it's beginning of the season, I would rather save her finger and make sure we can recover properly so we can get back to the games for the rest of the season as opposed to let's end it all right now. If we have a fracture, make it worse, have another weird fall. I mean, I would love to see a compound fracture, but nobody else would. So, <laughs> so let's kind of avoid those things if we can. <laughs> got it, got it. So uh, let's say Katie is a, she's a third child. She's got two, uh, two older brothers. She grew up pretty, pretty rough and tough. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she's standing there with you. She's making that full composite fist and she's telling you, look, I, I can go, I'm ready, I can do this. Um, she's not in a lot of pain. She really says there's, there's no pain. She just has that swelling and bruising. 
What do you think now? Change your opinion at all? Um, so a little bit. I mean, usually if I suspect a fracture or with most injuries, I'll put a tuning fork on there to see if I can get um, a response out of that. If I usually get like a sharp increase of pain with the kids, um, that, that'll usually be my key. Like, hey, let's just sit down. Let's go get an x-ray. Let's see how it feels. I don't have x-ray vision. Wish I did. <laughs> but the tuning fork kind of helps me guide that decision sometimes. But okay. if she is one of those rough, tough kind of kids, I'm more likely to kind of taper up, see how it feels. Again, if we're still having pain with the tape on there, it's a tournament. We're going to have more tournaments the rest of the season. If it's club compared to like a school game, we'll probably save it a little bit more because we're going to okay. have a longer club season compared to school. We also need to find out what's more important to her. Okay. Anybody else? Jennifer, Dr. Miller, any, any thoughts? What, what I'm would you probably do? a little more aggressive with that. I'm going to buddy tape her and send her back in okay. and just keep checking on her, you know, and I'm, to have yeah. a conversation with that parent and as long as I know that I have her secured in a buddy tape situation after the game I'm going to check her out and do another evaluation and talk to her parents seems reasonable okay yeah. all right let's see what happens so for Katie uh, she was she was buddy taped she's allowed to uh, to return to play she played the rest of the game without issue we'll call it the rest of the tournament without issue uh, she continued to play after that she re-injured three days later while she was going up for a layup in a, in a club basketball game um, when she was struck by the ball, and then she was seen that next day in the athletic trainer's office or the, the treatment room. Uh, the trainer said, hey, look, you got to go get this looked at now. So she came in. She presented a fracture clinic. She uh, had this x-ray. You can see that volar uh, avulsion there, that avulsion fracture volarly. Um, she was put in an extension blocking splint. She was sent over to OT uh, with plans to start early range of motion, and then no-showed her OT visit. Uh, she subsequently no-showed her next two visits and was just lost to follow up. The family wouldn't return calls anymore. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the volar plate injury. This is that common jammed finger, right? Just like many of these injuries, there's a very uh, variation of severity with these. Um, they can be pretty mild and minor, and there can be some that come with like a subluxation or a dislocation that could be pretty severe and, and need quite a bit more treatment. Uh, generally, it's gonna present with that kind of classic volar ecchymosis at the PIP joint, some swelling and effusion at the PIP joint. Uh, the range of motion can vary, again, based on the severity. They'll have tenderness over the collateral ligaments as well as the volar plate. Um, uh, the treatment for these really depends on the severity of the injury. Uh, again, some of them are just treated with simple buddy tape, early range of motion. Uh, when they come in, they've got this bony avulsion or a little bit more severity. We, we generally do refer them over to OT and give them to Lindsay to work with. So, Lindsay, what's your uh, game plan for these volar plates when they come in, like one like Katie's with that big fragment? When they have that big fragment, we usually will put them in an extension blocking splint, and I have examples if anyone is just really interested. Um, but typically 15, 20 degrees down just to let scar tissue take over and heal. Um, but the, we also know these get really stiff. So depending on their swelling, if they're super acute, really swollen, I just let them be for a week, put them in the splint, they get to rest, do nothing. And then at about a week, they're gonna start some gentle flexion. We still wanna keep them from full extension, but gentle flexion, and then if they're still really stiff, then at two weeks, we're gonna be more aggressive with flexion and then they can start some gentle extension. At three weeks, we get to transition them out and then really looking for full composite fist all the way in, all the way out, no pain, collateral ligaments feel good, stability's good, and then that's when we let them return. Um, also grip strength, usually at back, back to like 90% is what we look for. So. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let's go back to Katie. That's not where it ends with Katie. So she represents to the fracture clinic seven weeks later. Uh, this is not uncommon, uh, especially in this area we live in. Uh, we, she presents to the clinic due to the stiffness and deformity now in the finger. She was non-compliant with the original plan. She stopped the splint she was in after a week. Uh, she returned to volleyball and basketball despite having continued symptoms. Uh, the family states that they, uh, you know, she did have several other minor re-injuries they felt like were minor at least, and uh, they just wanted her to be able to finish the season and felt like they could come in and get it, get it treated later. So now you can look at these two x-rays, right, seven weeks apart. You can see that one of them now on the right, the seven weeks later, is subluxed, right? It's a much worse injury to deal with. This is going to take a lot more to get this back from a range of motion of deformity, contractures, a lot more you have to kind of work with. The uh, procedure is now quite a bit more invasive that we have to do to fix this. So she was sent over to our hand team. She underwent an ORIF to restore the joint and started a, a aggressive range of motion. In the end, she lost about 15 degrees of extension, 10 degrees of flexion, and, and probably uh, equally as frustrating to Katie is that she missed the next five months of sports getting this thing uh, healed up. 
Um, so uh, again, these are, are pretty common when we see these delayed presentations and, and families uh, just kind of make the decision to ignore the injury. Um, it's really important that we are all uh, advocates for the athlete in general. We're talking to them about these injuries, uh, especially you guys in the athletic training role, the team physician role, people that have that contact and, and that um, availability to talk to these athletes and their families. So we're going to talk about Andy now. Andy's a 16-year-old male, injured his wrist, jumping for a football, landing with his hands, kind of went up for the ball, clearly didn't get it, landed with his hands behind him. He was seen by the athletic trainer the following morning, just had some mild swelling, pain uh, with hypertension and radial deviation. He had soreness or tenderness at the snuff box, the volar scapular tubercle, and that scapular compression test was positive. So uh, the trainer, kind of the athletic trainer, discussed uh, kind of concerns for that scaphoid fracture and you know these these uh, three exams we talk about uh, we'll touch on later, but uh, those symptoms are all are pretty consistent with a scaphoid fracture or a concern for a scaphoid fracture. Uh, the parents were kind of convinced it wasn't anything because he could still move the wrist. Coach kind of told him, "Hey, if you move the wrist, it can be broken. You should be able to play." Uh, but uh, the family ultimately elected to, to not seek an evaluation and continue to let him play. Uh, they were re-injured two weeks later when they went and dove for a ball. Finally, the athletic trainer was able to convince them to go see ortho. So we're two weeks, uh, this was two weeks before playoffs, hence the reason Andy was really wanting to stay in there. He's 16, so it's for his junior year. He's, uh, he's a little bit old uh, or young for uh, his junior year, but he, he really wants to stay in, and you kind of understand and you get that if you, you're around Texas and you understand our mentality with football here. So uh, Andy was noted to have a proximal pole avulsion fracture off the, the scaphoid. It had to tear the scaphoid lunate ligament. Um, it's going to have a bad sequel. It's a bad injury. It doesn't look like a bad injury on x-ray, but certainly can be. Um, it's one that uh, can, be, can be found you know, relatively easily with that clinical exam if, if you're really astute to it and, and really pressing these kids and getting them back in. I would tell you, in my opinion, I don't think this kid ever should have been allowed to, to go back in. And so I think that goes back to the discussion between the athletic trainer that initially saw him and the coach recognizing coach doesn't have that medical knowledge um, that you've really got to just press upon them sometimes hey this isn't safe we've got to get them back in and, and kind of trust your gut on that so he was referred over to the hand team had surgical repair of the scaphoid ligament so a little bit about scaphoid fractures uh, again various degrees of uh, severity so whatever general types are distal or waist and a proximal pole which is what andy was uh, that proximal pole is really the most risk at AV, for AVN. Uh, we fix those more often than not. Uh, and all of these scaphoid fractures can be a little bit slow to heal. Uh, generally tell families these things may take 10 to 12 or more weeks oftentimes to heal and they'll need treatment or, or mobilization during most of that time frame. You have to be mindful for uh, cult fractures, right? This is one that oftentimes the x-ray doesn't end the story. If the patient's symptomatic and they come in to see us in clinic and they're symptomatic, we press on those three spots we talked about. and. They're sore there, uh, the mechanism makes sense, and we're often going to treat them conservatively and uh, put them into an immobilization of some form, be that a cast or a splint, and seal them back in two or three weeks and kind of reevaluate with x-rays and exam that, that kind of dictates our next step. Um, displaced fractures are a clear indication for fixation. Uh, and then non-displaced fractures sometimes can be managed in a, in a cast or a splint. Uh, most of the time we'll cast these kids just because the sequela of these injuries can be uh, pretty poor if they're not caught and, and managed correctly. Um, so we, we touched on a little bit of this, that fall backwards onto the wrist is often what you're looking for for these mechanisms of injury, uh, that radial load or hyperextension of the wrist when they fall. Usually these are associated with a little bit of a higher energy. Um, this isn't the kid that bumped the volleyball or hyperextended the wrist, hit a ball or catching a ball. That's usually not going to be the uh, proponent of this. Uh, presentation, that anatomic snuff box, um, kind of right here on this image you can see that anatomic snuff box. That volar scaphoid tubercle, which tends to be the most sensitive test for this, and then that scaphoid compression test where you kind of grind that first metacarpal down on it. Um, all right, we're going to move on to our next case. This is Luke, and uh, although this is a baseball tournament, which uh, I don't think there's a lot of athletic trainers covering baseball tournaments these days, but uh, we're going to act like Jennifer is covering this baseball tournament. <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer. Uh, so this is Luke. I also apologize that the volume on this is really the best part of this. Uh, this uh, it's a great crack that you hear when this ball hits. Um, but Luke is up to bat, takes one off the hand there. Again, uh, I wish I could make the noise for it, but I just don't have that talent. Um, he's 12 years old. He was hit by a pitch during the first inning of the championship game of the tournament. So uh, he was evaluated by, in this case, we're going to say Jennifer is there to evaluate him. She sees this picture on the side as kind of the clinical exam she gets. Uh, swelling at the DIP joint, a distal tip of the finger. She has a nail plate that's kind of uh, lifted and out of the nail fold. Um, she has some bleeding around the nail fold. There's no visible laceration, and there's an early sum of hematoma forming covering about 50% of that nail bed. What's your plan, Jennifer? Well, I'm thinking Luke doesn't want to go back into the game with that finger because <laughs> any movement, whether it's in the glove or it's his throwing hand, is going to be quite impossible to grip or catch. 
So I'll, I'll evaluate Luke. I'll probably split him, try to ice him down, recheck him, talk to his parents, but probably refer him. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty reasonable, um, unfortunately. Luke's a pretty tough kid, too. He's 12 years old. It's a championship game, and we're in Texas. So, uh, you yeah. know, whoever looked at Luke said, hey, you know what, let's do, uh, let's do something different. They decided to do a Band-Aid with a strip of tape and, and buddy tape those fingers, and maybe he can't bat, maybe he can't throw, but maybe we'll let him run bases. He's the fastest right. kid on the team. Let's let him run. Uh, so that's kind of what they elected to do. Uh, he was then seen in the Fracture Clinic two days later. I'm presuming this game was maybe on Saturday, so he showed up maybe Monday or Tuesday Fracture Clinic. He was noted to have this displaced open fracture of the distal phalanx. We call that a Seymour fracture. A uh, really common injury we see in these kids. Oftentimes it's uh, sports injuries. We also see them in our younger population with like the car door or the door jams. Um, you know, we kind of discuss treatment options at this point. He's a couple days in. Uh, closed reduction uh, with a washout and a nail bed is, is kind of the appropriate treatment for this, especially in the acute setting. Uh, so we like to go ahead and do that. We blocked him. We started him on uh, antibiotics. Uh, we did a nail bed repair and a reduction of this. Um, and then at, we transition over to the stack splint, just kind of a finger splint that just protects the tip of that finger, gives you uh, motion through the MCPJ, but it mobilizes the PIP and DIP joint. Um, to some degree, the, the PIP is somewhat free. Uh, and then at six weeks, he was pain free with full range of motion. We released him back to activities as tolerated. So six weeks, not too bad. So uh, a little bit about Seymour fractures. We just kind of talked about the mechanism of those. Um, the, the important thing to know on these is we don't want to delay treatment, right? We've, we've you know, lots and lots of our literature supports the fact that these need early and, and aggressive treatment. Appropriate treatment of these, we really like to have these done within the first 24 hours. Dr. Ho showed that there's a, a 12-fold increase in treatment when these are delayed, um, or an increased risk of infection, rather, when these are delayed for treatment. So again, that appropriate treatment we just talked about, that washout, uh, start antibiotics as soon as we can, get that fracture reduced and do a no bed repair. Uh, the consequences if we delay this, right? So osteomyelitis, infection of that bone, uh, then often can result in uh, physeal arrest or shutting down that, that distal phalanx. And this is gonna cost this kid a lot longer time period. He's probably gonna be out for you closer to 10 to 12 weeks, um, kind of dealing with it when it gets infected. So uh, the message on these, when you see that fingernail looking like this, this kid needs to go ahead and get seen. It doesn't need to be one we, we delay. Let's go ahead and get him in as fast as we can. All right, let's move on to Tyler. Uh, Dr. Miller, we're going we're gonna to use you on this one. So Tyler's a 15-year-old male. He had an uh, injury to the right ring finger, making a tackle in the last regular season football game. He's right-hand dominant, multi-sport athlete, junior year. He plays uh, wide receiver, just made the playoffs, of course. Uh, he's also the varsity shortstop. So this kid's a stud. He's a good athlete. Um, he was initially seen by the athletic trainer the following morning. He had swelling over the, and fullness over the DIP joint, uh, particularly in the volar aspect. He was unable to actively flex that DIP, kind of holds that finger in extension like this with his cascade exam. He had that palpable fullness and soft tissue mass volarly just proximal to that PIP joint. Uh, so the athletic trainer is pretty astute to this and something doesn't smell right. She, uh, she calls you and says, hey, Dr. Miller, can you come over here and just take a look at this if you're on campus? So you swing in. What's your concern? What are you thinking about this kid? Yeah, so I'm worried about Tyler. Uh, you're supposed to be able to move your finger, so that's a problem. Um, when he's not able to flex it there at the DIP, um, you know, that you've given us a pretty classic mechanism for, for what we call a jersey finger. Um, so I'm worried about a, a little a tendon rupture or avulsion there. And uh, as a wide receiver, I think that's one of the things that you've kind of alluded to is part of our return to play decision depends on position, you know. And so uh, as a wide receiver, obviously he's got to be able to use his hands, and, and so trying to splint him or do something to his fingers and still allow him to, to catch the ball um, is going to really in, inhibit his ability to participate at the high level that he'd like to. Um, so this is probably one we're going to go ahead and, and get him evaluated. Okay. So you're going to send him in that day or tell him like next week or like as soon as can? Yeah. I mean, I think that if this is a, you know, Friday night game, it's probably reasonable for us to see it Monday. Okay. Yeah. Probably need to go to the ER. One more question. What are you going to put him in? Are you going to put him in something? Yeah, I mean, split him for comfort. You know, I don't, I don't know that it's going to impact his ultimate outcome or treatment plan gotcha. necessarily. Gotcha. All right. So a jersey finger, yep. So uh, like uh, Dr. Miller stated, this is a jersey finger. So the bulging of the FDP tendon and the distal phalanx, uh, present just like we talked about that inability to flex that DIP joint uh, remains in slight extension in the resting position when compared to the other digits. Uh, kind of testing that D, uh, FDP function, you can kind of see how you do that over here by keeping that PIP straight and kind of having them flex that DIP joint. 
Um, pal sometimes you can palpate or kind of feel that tendon, particularly if it's retracted, right? That's what we want to prevent in these injuries is retraction. We want to make sure they can't be retracted. So to your point, he doesn't need to go back in. You know, the risk of further injury there makes this a little bit worse. If, if you think about that tendon ruptures here and it retracts back down, each level it retracts down, it's going to be a harder repair, a little bit more invasive procedure. So we want to protect this kid. We want to keep him out of the game, out of the practices, uh, get him seen as soon as possible. These are ones that we want kind of a, a more urgent referral. We don't want these to sit around and wait. Uh, we want these kind of splinted and sent in. Uh, so this, uh, with Tyler, he was initially seen at a local urgent care after uh, Dr. Miller suggested he needs to go get seen. They went the next morning to an urgent care, took an x-ray. The x-ray was negative. They told him, man, it just seems like it's sore and bruised. You probably have a big contusion, and maybe sprained some of the ligaments in your fingers. So uh, I think you'll be okay, but let's get it buddy taped, and I think it'll improve over the next couple weeks. Again, confirmed with them that the x-rays are negative. So uh, Tyler, you know, said, great, let's go play. He tried and went and played the best he could over the next few weeks. Uh, season ended, and he was about six weeks out when he uh, came into ortho because he had stiffness and he couldn't grip the baseball, right? So not the pain, not the limited range of motion, not that clearly something's not right with my finger. It was that he couldn't grip the baseball. Um, and, and that's the mentality oftentimes we deal with with our athletes that are just under a lot of pressure to push and, and try to produce. They don't, they don't want to let down their coach, their team. Um, they, they put a lot of hard work into this, right? And sometimes we have to remember and take that step back that we've got to advocate and, and really stress to these families how important uh, getting that evaluation and, and kind of following instructions are. So again, he's six weeks out. Uh, we get an MRI. Uh, you can see where that's retracted um, from the DIPJ down all the way down past his uh, PIP joint. Um, he, he now is, is going to have a, a little bit more of an invasive procedure. He's got to uh, have that high risk, of the, or he has the high risk of the contracture deformity when these present as a uh, delayed presentation, particularly with one that's retracted. So the procedure now really involves a uh, two-stage reconstruction with grafting. Um, he's going to miss the entire baseball season. Um, so I'm sure Tyler's not really happy with missing that entire baseball season. This, this may or may not. It's hard to know. We don't know what it looked like initially, but if this thing wasn't retracted, it may not have required such a... Uh, invasive procedure, a little bit less time in recovery. Um, so again, in the long run, this cost Tyler a little bit more than, than what it would have initially with, with early treatment. Uh, so let's go to the next one. This is David. Uh, he's a 14-year-old male, had an injury to the right index finger when he was struck by a soccer ball. He's right-hand dominant. He is the freshman goalkeeper as well as a pitcher uh, for his baseball team. He was seen by, uh, let's say he was seen, I don't know, Katrina, he was seen by you. Um, the following morning, he had the swelling at the DIP joint, had dorsal bossing just proximal to that nail fold. Uh, the, the finger rests at about 20 degrees of flexion. We call that extensor lag. So he's kind of got that finger that's sitting in that extensor lag position. Uh, he's unable to actively extend that DIP joint, and he has uh, isolated tenderness over the distal phalanx and, and globally over the DIP joint. Uh, what's your concern here? Or do you have a concern? I am concerned with that finger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so... Is it mallet finger? Good, yeah. Yep. I so I'd be concerned with concern. mallet finger, possible possible fracture with this, especially um, he played soccer the day before? So uh, yep. Okay, yep, so if he's the keeper, there's not too much we can do to, like, buddy tape or stabilize yeah. while yeah. they're wearing the keeper's gloves. So right. I would definitely want to make sure we get him in if he can't move the distal aspect of his finger. <laughs> so if I'm hearing you right, can't move, bad? Yeah. Bad. Not good, bad. should be concerned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Just like a little Seems bit. Seems like a common yep. theme, right? That seems mm -hmm. reasonable. Yes. Okay. So let's see what happened with David. Yeah, you nailed it. So he's, he's got that classic mallet finger. He has got pain and swelling, that dorsal bossing. Um, you can kind of see that right here. His is not all that impressive, but usually you'll see that dorsal bossing kind of right in this area. Um, he comes into the clinic. We can now confirm with an x-ray that he's got this avulsion fracture uh, where he was kind of pulled off from uh, where that tendon avulsed. Um, these can be soft tissue or bony. And so just because an x-ray is negative, again, uh, like several of these injuries, it doesn't necessarily mean all is well. Um, this is an injury that occurs with forced flexion of the DIP joint and active extension. A uh, really, really common injury we see, these will present either acutely or chronically. Uh, this is one that's more, um, probably one of the more likely ones we see in the chronic setting where this kind of gets delayed or neglected for quite a while. So I would agree with you, if it's not moving and it's stuck like this, there's, there's probably something not right. So uh, he received a close reduction and was just kind of placed essentially for this. It just means you extend the DIP joint um, and you put them into a uh, splint. We get them over to an extension blocking splint. We get them over to... Uh, Lindsay, who will take over now, and you just tell me when you want me to hit the video. 
Okay, so for these, it's super important that they stay fully extended for a full six weeks. If they let it drop at all, their six weeks starts over. And so that's where I really preach to them. Um, most of them think that they can still play because it's just the end of their finger and there's just a splint on the end of their finger. But I kind of go over and over. If it falls off, your whole six weeks starts. So if you decide to play at four weeks and this slides off, you start over. Um, so for sidelines specifically, if they still decide to play, I think I usually give them Coban or tape or something so this thing will stay on. If I can't convince them to not play, then I at least want to give them the resources to keep it on. Um, the other thing, especially it's hot in Texas um, and it's hot when you play, so really I usually make them two splints so they can take it off and you can play the video. This is how I teach them to, to put it on and off, so really sliding it up, keeping their hand firm so if they need to wash their hand or you need to look at it that's kind of how they're going to and I show parents how to do it and that way it stays in full extension we don't have to start over but we can still have the skin care because sometimes they come back and it's macerated and just looks gross so um, this is a good way to avoid that and then after their six weeks they transition and still wear it at night for four weeks and we kind of just do a slow progressive no passive range of motion until 10 weeks. So they can work on active range of motion, but no passive range of motion um, until after that 10 week. And most of the time they don't need it by that point. Got it. Do you do all of these get the nighttime splint? For the most part, most part, I would say it's easy enough to wear it at night. And so most of them do, but if they are I would say most, most, do. most of Got them it. do. Got it. All right. Important to recognize the difference with this. Uh, you know, when, if you guys are seeing these in the ER setting or uh, private practice setting, when there is a mallet finger like this that is reduced, so this joint is reduced, versus one that is subluxed, these are different animals. These, uh, these definitely need a different treatment. Um, when the joint is subluxed, that gets a uh, ORIF. These get fixed. Um, again, this goes back to safety, right? Because this is a, an injury that we commonly will get that question from families where they say, so you're telling me at six weeks, um, if I came in at 10 weeks, it's still six weeks in the splint. Or if I come in day two, it's still six weeks in the splint. And they kind of, why, why would I not just play and, and deal with it, you know, six weeks from now? Seems like a rational, logical question to some degree. But the reality is you're trying to prevent this subluxation uh, and that we know that these tend to do much better acutely when we get to them early. We're able to immobilize them to success uh, an ability to prevent loss of range of motion, clinical deformity, um, and, and function, return of function is much higher when we get to these in the acute setting. Uh, all right, I think this is our last case. This is Ashley. She's a level 10 gymnast. She has a left index finger that she landed wrong on the, the low bar at state meet. Uh, the team physician uh, was on site, had noticed this gross deformity, extended the PIV joint. Uh, you can kind of see this finger doesn't look right. Pretty obvious there, something's wrong. Dr. Miller, you're there on, on site. What are you going to do with this finger? What's, what's your approach here? Yeah, I'd probably attempt an uh, attempt a reduction if I if I felt like the athlete was ready for that and see if I could get a reduce. Got it. Yep, I think that's probably pretty reasonable. Um, what do you do if you try and it doesn't reduce? Uh, I may give it one more go, okay. um, and and then you know if if we feel like we've given it pretty good effort and it's not going, then I feel like there may be something stopping me. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably not going to just keep yanking on it. Yeah. No, I think that's reasonable. So that's exactly what happened. They did a, attempted a simple reduction on site. It was unsuccessful, and then they were sent directly to ortho. She presented the fracture clinic about an hour later. Um, this is a well-known patient to us. So uh, she came in, just kind of walked in with this finger that clearly didn't look right. We got our x-rays. We can now see that she's got an injury at the volar plate as well as a central slip. Um, you know, bad, bad injury, bad actor. Uh, a lot of risk here for loss of range of motion, stiffness, all the above. So we, we went ahead and blocked her. Uh, we did a digital block for a close reduction. Uh, using that same technique, that gentle traction and downward force over the dorsal middle phalanx. Uh, these generally will, will slide in pretty easily when they're dorsally dislocated. Um, but, uh, like Dr. Miller alluded to, if they do not, this is not something you want to force. Let's not force the issue. Let's give it a try, maybe a second try, and that's really it. If they're not going gently, there's probably some structure that could be preventing it. Um, oftentimes, it's just as simple as, as pain and guarding is blocking this, and so getting them blocked in the clinical setting will help tremendously. And, 
kind of relax them enough to get these things reduced. Um, once we get them reduced, we'll put them in an extension block at 20 degrees, and then again, we'll get them over to Lindsay. This is a, a really important one for Lindsay to see. I think all of these really uh, benefit from, from OT and, and really formal OT. So, Lindsay, go ahead. All right. So, for her specifically, we put her in that same dorsal blocking splint for four weeks, especially since she was so dislocated. Just keep her down um, and in and let scar tissue take over. At four weeks, we could start flexion, but we really did a very gradual. So we want to give her a little bit of flexion, but not so much that she's going to dislocate again. So we added 15 degrees a week, and it took us quite a long time to get all of her motion back. And honestly, she didn't get full composite. She got safe and functional and could return to gymnastics, but her flexion and extension were still about 10 degrees or 20 um, for flexion lacking at the end. So we use a what we call an LMB, which is a dynamic extension splint that she would wear to kind of help and maintain her extension, but she was safe. And then you can play the video. I forgot that was a video. And so this is just how we grade their flexion. So she knows exactly where she can go and she won't go beyond that. And then we'll go back into her other splint. Perfect. So uh, she went back at four months, mm -hmm. uh, near full flexion obtained, and uh, full return at five months, but was still lacking about 10 degrees. So again, we talked about this a little bit. What if it won't reduce? Uh, again, this is likely a scenario where there's something entrapped or preventing that reduction, and you don't want to make it worse. You certainly can make it worse. You can buttonhole it through and make it a little bit more of a complex injury. Um, if it's reduced on the sideline, I think this is really important for you guys on sideline coverage. If these things are reduced on the sideline, this absolutely 100% of the time needs an x-ray. So um, this isn't the kid you put back in. you got concerns about stability. I think this is one that you need to uh, mobilize and send them in to get an x-ray and uh, let that x-ray dictate what the next step is and when they can return to play. So sideline management, you know, just like any EMS uh, type protocols, I think uh, kind of create a safe scene. Uh, minimize that zone of injury, the swelling, uh, remove cut, restrictive clothing, uh, mobilize the joints above and below, and then kind of recognizing that need for emergent care. Uh, you have to communicate with the parents, the coaches, the medical staff. These things are kind of, I would assume, in y'all's world, kind of protocols that are set up to, to handle this. Um, you know, to me, I think it's kind of one of those, I, I like to keep things simple, and in my approach uh, from a standpoint of identifying which one of these are problems or not, you know, there's three categories, right? The needs emergent transfer. Probably not something that happens a lot in hands and athletic injuries, but certainly can. This thumb could be an example of that uh, versus something that can be safely immobilized and sent in uh, maybe to be seen in the next week. Uh, and then that one that can be evaluated uh, for safe return to play with or without some form of immobilization. Uh, back to that initial question of who's best suited, right? I, I think this is that multidisciplinary approach. There's no one person. I think everybody's got a different aspect or perspective that they get to see. I think that's where the real challenge in dealing with athletic injuries are, especially in uh, this this area and the society we live in where, where sports are, are so uh, prominent um, and taken so serious among, amongst our youth athletes. It's important for us as providers, as athletic trainers, uh, therapists, everybody across the board to recognize our goals really to protect the athlete and, that not and that's not necessarily always, um, it doesn't always line up with the goal of the team or um, the, the coach in some instances. So I think we've got to keep that in mind and, and figure out a way to navigate that. From a psychological component, I think that's one of the important things that the athletic trainer has the ability to assess that maybe the rest of us don't because they're uh, with that player more frequently. They're able to kind of get a sense of when that player's able to return from a psychological standpoint. Are they, do they feel comfortable and ready? Sports are all about confidence. So if you're not confident, um, you don't think you can perform, it makes it really challenging to do. And that's, uh, that's something that may not get picked up on by some of the other members of the team. Um, obviously, our, our therapists are really good at kind of telling us when they're functionally able to, what their um, objective measures are that can kind of tell us they're functionally cleared to return. Um, so I think everybody's got a pretty important role. Uh, that's really it. You know, we left a lot of time on here. I wouldn't say a lot. We've got about 15 minutes to kind of just talk about things a little bit. I think uh, this panel is a great discussion forum for us to kind of bounce off some ideas and some of the challenges you guys deal with. Um, we'll probably have plenty of time for some questions as well. You guys in the audience have questions or people online would have questions. Um, I, I think one of, the ch one of the questions I think I would start with, I'd like to ask from an athletics trainer standpoint and Dr. Miller, you sideline coverage folks, um, what is your, how do you communicate with the families? Let's say that finger dislocation happens in the middle of a football game. Where's the family come into play? Are you able to reduce it? Um, do you have to get the family down there to talk to them? Kind of how's that play out? 
go take a jiff or go for it. So, you know, because I'm fortunate and I have, you know, a physician on my sideline, I have another athletic trainer, and I feel like I can communicate well with most of my parents and they know who I am. And if that's the case, I do have my physician with me. And while this is going on, I find the parent, and usually, you know, parents are ready to go and watching their kids, so they're pretty easy to find in the stands. So after it's reduced, we'll go up and say, hey, this is the, this is the scenario and this is what we've done and this is our plan. Gotcha. You know, I think that's. Everybody else take that same approach? Katrina, Dr. Miller, kind of your thoughts, uh, talk to the family first or is there a, something set up that's a protocol that allows you to, to try the reduction without it or do you have to get that? Yeah, I think it depends on your setting and kind of how acute it happens because uh, a lot of times with these dislocations, the more quickly we can reduce it, um, the more successful we are. So if, for example, the athlete just went down and we've come out on the field, we're evaluating them and it's within the first minute or two from the time it happened and we can kind of reduce it as part of our exam, then everybody's more comfortable, it's happy, and we may get them off and have already done it. Um, so I consider that to be emergency treatment, which we have, you know, permission to do. Now, if it's been, you know, an hour before and it happened in a soccer game and they've made their way over to see you in a tournament or something like that, now it's been out a while, then I think it's very reasonable to have that conversation about are we going to attempt reduction or not, um, you know, with the parents beforehand. And um, depending on your setting, parents may or may not be available, but I think it is important to realize that we are dealing with uh, minors. Um, most of the time, these are children, you know, under the age of 18. Um, they're participating most of the time in an amateur sport. Uh, and so sometimes our return to play decisions, we feel pressured and we feel, um, you, you know, it's important to put it back and you ask the 16 year old kid, they're always going to want to go back, but, um, but realizing that there's a, there's a lot more significant things going on. And so I do try to have that conversation with the parents and at least get, you know, shared decision making, have that conversation. And if they're not there, I, I lean on the ATs to get me a phone number. Um, we'll pick up the phone, we'll call or have the athlete call from their phone. So maybe mom or dad actually pick it up. If I call from my phone, they don't. Um, and so we can have those conversations to talk about, you know, treatment options. And if the family feels comfortable, then we may proceed. Yeah, you mentioned shared decision making. I think that's a great term. And I think that's something that anybody that, that works in the sports, uh, sports medicine world probably has to, to deal with. Um, one of the approaches I take frequently with our patients in clinic would be if I have a patient that were, have an injury that's reasonable to go back, there are some injuries that aren't reasonable, right? That Seymour fracture sitting in front of us, I'm not letting that kid go back and play. That, you, you can't do that. There are a lot of injuries that are kind of in that gray zone where maybe I can put them in something, immobilize them that's somewhat safe from the return. Um, there's nothing that's foolproof. There's nothing that's gonna guarantee they can't re-injure, right? Sports come with inherent risks and that's kind of what I tell the family. Um, this is ultimately my job is to tell you the risks, explain and make sure you understand the risks involved. Um, help you see if there's ways we can minimize those risks, but you ultimately get to decide how we're going to mitigate those risks, and you're going to be the one to, to kind of um, decide if you want to let him play despite those risks. Um, I think that's a, probably a, several times a day that's a conversation I would assume any of you guys dealing with the, uh, the sports medicine world kind of deal with the same. So any questions from the audience? All right, Ben. Well, um, so Doc... Um, junior uh, needs to keep playing and it looks straight enough uh, so just buddy tape it because it's either going to be okay or it's going to need surgery so I don't understand what you're saying put him back in yeah so these these are always the fun conversations for sure and 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 that's the reality of what we deal with a lot um, and I and I will say that there is a little bit of a difference between sideline based medicine and, and clinic based medicine. And so sometimes when I'm in clinic and I have an x-ray and I have a diagnosis, you know, my answer may be, I'm not clearing you. You're not cleared to play um, based on what we know now. But at the time of the injury in the middle of the game function, they may not have much swelling yet. They may have reasonable function and, and strength and maybe able to protect themselves or we may be able to protect the injury. You know, depending on what it is, it may be something that we could potentially stabilize, again, based on their position, based on, um, you know, where we are in the family's conversation. We may have those conversations about risks versus benefits and, and sort of say, okay, this is something we feel like we can stabilize. Um, you know, wrist injuries or other things, we, you know, there may or may not be a fracture there occasionally on, and we may be able to stabilize them, splint them somehow, and allow them to, to finish out the game. But it is, um, we, get, we get a lot of pressure. Uh, from, from the athlete, the coach, and the parents. And ultimately, as Jared said, we have to protect the athlete 
uh, sometimes from themselves and sometimes from others. So we have to kind of make a medical decision and, and, and then move forward. Um, let me ask you guys, uh, maybe each of you probably have a different perspective, but um, do, we, do we currently have any um, literature on the use of ultrasounds to diagnose finger injuries on the sideline? I mean, now that we're getting uh, butterfly, for example, other things that, you know, you can hook an ultrasound to your iPhone. Um, is that something that may fall into the algorithm at some point? Yeah, I, I mean, I think of some of my colleagues that have more ultrasound experience are certainly comfortable with the portable ultrasounds and are utilizing them for, for you know, a, a variety of diagnoses. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, a subtle finger fracture may be something that you could, you could look at. You may be able to, to see some of those dorsal avulsion fractures or something along those lines. So um, I, I, I think that there are definitely multiple uses of ultrasound that, that now as the technology has improved, the cost has come down. Um, and, and so at, at what point will that maybe trickle over from, you know, more of a APP and or physician training background into maybe in the AT setting, you know, at some point, um, and, and or maybe even to EMS, ultimately with fast exams and abdominal bleeding and things. I, th I think ultrasound is a great resource that, that you know, there's no radiation. Um, you can do it relatively inexpensively nowadays. So I, I think it's a great resource that we could utilize. How much, another question I have for you, how much does it play in, you know, trade-offs, right? There's trade-offs to everything. Um, how much do you factor in circumstances where this is a uh, senior year, somebody trying, you know, they're playing for a scholarship, um, it's, it's their shot, it's their one opportunity. Um, how do you guys factor that in? How do you all address that? Kind of where does that make a play in y'all's uh, weight as decisions? So for me, it's more of a conversation with the athlete. So for example, I had a football player last year who repeatedly dislocated um, his distal phalanx on his pointer finger. He's a wide receiver. He had a scholarship to school. So like we were more, for me, I was trying to explain to him, like, it's important that we make sure this is taken care of now so it doesn't affect your scholarship. You know, if you want to play professionally in the long run, you want to do really well at college, we need to make sure we take care of it now. Your life is set up That's after cool. high school. Let's kind of focus on that aspect. Now, did he listen to me? Absolutely not. <laughs> but it was definitely a conversation to kind of help get his brain thinking a little bit differently so he could take some of those factors into play. Now, he had a really easy off season and we worked on some finger exercises. During season, it wasn't gonna happen, but he was more aware of it and cognizant of um, the repercussions if he kept re-injuring. Gotcha. Anybody else, any thoughts on that? Or? You know, it's, it's always hard to get a student athlete who they feel like this is the pinnacle of their, their little career here. And, and so I try to get them to see down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what mm -hmm. Katrina is saying. And I always, I like to bring in the student athlete and the parents and have a family decision to talk about your future and what's best for your future, whether it's playing for us the rest of the season or go into that Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three school and extending your career. Yeah, that's a good so approach. So it's hard, you know. I like having those family discussions, and in the end, I always say, "Go home and have this conversation over the dinner table with these kids." Yeah, I like it. I like that approach. Other questions out there uh, online or in the audience? What are our current rules right now about playing in a club? Can we, can we put the fist wrapped in a club and then um, pad, pad that to play? Um, Fo football, sorry. So I do a lot of individual work. So I work with UIL, TAPS, and then another, um, it's like a collegiate prep kind of league. I know for TAPS we are able to club the cast. <laughs> um, I've done it many, many times. I need to have that doctor's note where it specifically states that they are allowed to play casted 
also wrapped. Um, I've done it for UIL as well. Um, I usually use like the blue foam padding, then I'll put a layer of bubble wrap over it, and then an ace wrap, and then we'll just white tape it so nothing comes off, but they are allowed to play clubbed, to my knowledge. <laughs> My uh, six-year-old played clubbed soccer over the past weekend as he was being managed for a thumb fracture with our colleagues here in the fracture clinic. And so some of it, uh, when you get outside of the, the higher level sports, some of it's referee dependent. Um, and uh, most of the time it's, you know, obviously we wanna make sure it's medically safe, but, but trying to protect the other players from kids swinging around a club and hitting them. So that's where the padding is. It's, it's more about, I think the families are, are perceived that the padding is to protect the fracture. The cast is to protect the fracture. The padding is to protect the other, the opponents on the field there. Um, and then it's our decision whether or not it's safe to participate. And I think that's something that these guys deal with quite a bit is whether you can play in a cast or not, depending on fracture location, stability, acuity, you know, and that, that and conversation may change as you get a little further out from the injury, but that is something I get a lot from the athletic trainers. I, sometimes I get phone calls and they'll say, you know, why won't your guys let this kid play with this fracture? Whereas, you know, a month ago they let this kid play with this fracture and I have to kind of go through some of those thought processes and explain that the, the, everyone's a little bit different, individualized. Yeah, we get a lot of that, uh, absolutely. Um, we, we, for the most part, there are injuries. I think there's two different things, right? You're talking about is it safe to play based on the injury or is, it, is the league going to allow them to play? I think those are two different separate issues. Um, and, and the injury question really depends on the injury. And to your point, that is a frequent problem we'll have. We'll have an athletic trainer or a coach or a family uh, calling saying, why can't Johnny play when uh, Jimmy played? They both had a hand injury or both had a hand fracture or a finger fracture. Well, again, it goes back to explaining that uh, finger fracture doesn't mean the same thing. One term doesn't encompass all the different types of injuries you can have. Some of them, the, the vari uh, variation in severity and uh, the sequela that can occur from them. Um, that that's brings up a really good point. You know, um, the other scenario that I'm assuming you probably see a lot in clinic, uh, Dr. Miller, is you know, HIPAA nowadays uh, definitely has created a, a different realm of, of how we have to communicate um, and, and safely uh, communicate between the athletic trainer, the coaches, the parents. Um, getting that consent is a really important thing. Uh, and it's not uncommon for us to have a kid in the clinic that maybe tells us they don't want to play, but they don't want the coach to know they don't want to play, right? And so again, our job as uh, on the medical side of things is to be an advocate for our patient and we have a patient telling us they don't want to play or they don't feel comfortable playing, but they don't want to. My job is to protect that, that, that student athlete, right? And that becomes a real challenge when those phone calls come through, particularly when we can't reach out and say, hey, Jennifer, you know, here's why, right? I've got, to, uh, I've got to get the family to tell me it's okay for me to have that communication. Um, that's a real challenge. I would imagine it runs on, on both ends, the frustration on both ends, and so uh, as, as we move in the direction of shared decision making, moving more important, uh, being a more, part, a more important part of this, sorry. Uh, I think that's something we have to keep in mind that maybe we can find a way to better streamline those conversations uh, safely and um, navigate the, the legalities in, involved. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm a huge advocate for athletic trainers. I feel like athletic trainers are sort of, you know, heroes in, in the background that don't get any recognition and, and really a lot of the, you know, people don't know what athletic trainers do, don't know what their background is. Um, and, and I say people, I mean, coaches, parents, school nurses, uh, you know, athletes, you know, the general public in general don't understand that they are medical providers, um, often have NPI numbers and master's degrees and um, a lot of training. And so are, to me are absolutely part of the healthcare team and, and are, 99% of the time are out there providing the care that I'm there 1% of the time on a sideline on Friday nights with them, but most of the time they're making the decisions without us there. Um, and and are, as, as Jared said, know the athletes very well. Um, so I rely on my athletic trainers a lot, both when I'm there um, at the game. I you know, often will allow the AT to do the evaluation first and, and let me know their thoughts and whether they need or want my involvement. Um, but also when I'm not there, um, I think that they are, they are huge for the athletes. And so I spend a lot of time educating parents um, on that in the clinic. And, and I think that it's very helpful to understand that the athletic trainer is going to be able to help advocate for your child at the school and in the setting and help protect them from the coaches and, and help them with their rehabilitation process and gradually get back. And so I think it, it, it serves the purpose of helping the family now embrace that and understand what the role of the AT is. 
but it also allows me to open up that line of communication because then I explain to them, you know, if it's okay with you, I would like to reach out to your athletic trainer and let them know what's going on so that we can be on the same page. Uh, and, and then we can have them sign a lease and we can now reach out and, and have that conversation. And I think it really does help the athletic trainer do what they need to do. And just last week I was having a conversation and it was a family that was some sensitive information that I was not able to share with the athletic trainer, but I was able to re relay that there were other factors involved in my decision because they were kind of wondering why for this particular diagnosis is this athlete not cleared? And I was able to sort of explain that there are other factors that we that are involved that I'm not able to disclose to them. And they were like, we get it. That's so helpful because now we can advocate for that athlete. I can talk to coach. We completely are going to change our approach because now we have information that we didn't have without really having all of the information. And the family was okay with that because it allowed the athlete to maintain their privacy. Um, and the IT was now able to better advocate for that child and protect them rather than feeling like this is a kid's just trying to get out of participating all the time, but I truly did have the athlete restricted. Um, and so, so I think those conversations are very, very helpful um, as much as we can have them and, and realizing that although there are sometimes legal barriers that make it hard, and I know our athletic trainers get very frustrated when they call up looking for information and our ATs may say, we can't talk to you because we need the family to sign a release. It's not that we don't want to, I promise. We really want to talk to you guys. And I think, you know, same thing, reaching out to us is very helpful too. I just want to thank uh, everybody for, for joining us this morning. Uh, special thanks to our panel for coming in this morning. It's early. You guys all have uh, responsibilities and uh, teams to be with, so uh, we will respect that time. And again, just can't thank you guys enough for all that you do and, and the relationships that, uh, that we all share. Thanks very much. Thank you.